Every time I go on TikTok or watch a YouTube short, hell, even some threads on Twitter, at least once a day, there will be some kind of debate about if 2023 has become one of, if not the best years of gaming. And considering the handful of releases that I've personally had the time to play, it certainly is in the conversation at the very least, since there are so many well-regarded titles I haven't even been able to touch yet. While some will claim it's mid, maybe to be contrarian, or maybe because they only play Call of Duty, or maybe because the year was met with a lot of major releases that launched buggy, that honestly still wasn't enough to put a damper on the game release cycle. Axios even put out a report that this was one of the best review slate of video games in 20 years, which is an undoubtedly impressive feat. So now that November is here and in the spirit of the game awards season that is now upon us, considering most of the major releases are out for 2023, I thought this would be a good opportunity to talk about this phenomenal period for games and if it can stand up to other behemoth years like 2017 and 2007. I don't want to say the year started slow, since looking back on it, there were already so many memorable games in Q1. Hi-Fi Rush's stealth launch and the Dead Space remake 2023 came out swinging. But things really started rolling along in March with the Resident Evil 4 remake. The remake saga of Resident Evil began all the way back in 2002 with the GameCube. But after an HD port to PC and modern consoles in 2014, it reignited interest in seeing the classics revived with modern aesthetics. All of this culminated with the remake of the game that many thought would be too good to be given such a rehaul. The game that not only redefined Resident Evil for many years to come, but a game that changed what survival horror meant. With some tweaks to the story to modernize it, and bring it more in line with what feels like Capcom's new vision, it is an otherwise faithful recreation of Leon Kennedy's mission in rural Spain to save the president daughter, all while having to relive the traumatic night. In February of 2023, EA restructured its company in what would be the first step in a massive 6% of total layoffs across their 12,900 staff. Starting with the 200 QA staff in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, who all worked on Apex Legends. In March, CEO Andrew Wilson said in an email to staff, the new direction for EA would be focusing on smaller narrative focused games and in lesser numbers, as well as titles that could build communities with social tools and blockbuster level storytelling. After hundreds of staff were laid off, Wilson increased his annual pay package from 19.9 .9 million to 20.7 million. In May, arguably the most highly anticipated game of the decade was released. The Legend of Zelda Tears of the Kingdom. Nintendo's behemoth sequel to Breath of the Wild was in development for what felt like a lifetime, a wait that was made much more painful due to the lack of communication from the big N, yet much sweeter on release thanks to its enormous range of surprises. The community was left theorizing about what the initial teaser could have meant for years only to be shown just enough to be satiated in the months leading up to release. What we got was so much more than I and I think anyone else could have expected. Not only did this game deliver on extremely unique and inventive building mechanics, it also kept its larger secret hidden in plain sight. The depths. The game featured not only a reworked Hyrule from the first game, but dozens of sky islands to explore and a map that mirrored the scope of what stretched upwards from the earth to the gargantuan caves that slumbered below. May saw the third round of layoffs for the staff of the highly popular game engine Unity, with 600 employees being let go to set up for higher growth for the company according to CEO John Ricitellio. Months later, it would be revealed that the growth for the company meant revamping the pay structure for customers, announcing the change to charge all users an install fee for each time a player installs a game. Introducing these new scaling fees left many indie developers scrambling and wondering how such a poorly thought out policy shift could threaten potential success with unpredictable costs, and whether or not they should abandon the platform to rebuild their skill set with a less predatory engine. Unity later walked this back, changed the fee threshold to anyone over a $200,000 sales minimum, and removed all mention of install costs. John Ricitellio later stepped down as CEO, and 8% of total employees were let go within roughly one year.
After a tumultuous few years rebuilding the trust following the rough launch of Street Fighter V, Capcom feel like they are seemingly back with their sixth mainline installment of the prestigious fighting game franchise. While it certainly wasn't a perfect launch with a lot of roster mainstays missing, it's hard to say it wasn't extremely hype. I was seeing people I've never seen shown interest in fighting games tweet about who their new mains are, their battles with ladder climbing, and overall excitement for a newfound game to dive into. It truly was a monumental event. While fighting games are still fairly niche, this year has given us new content to either play or look forward to from the titans of the genre, and I think a lot of that can be attributed to the introduction of modern controls. And look, that conversation is so much bigger than I can talk about right now, and since I haven't really been into the FGC since Street Fighter 4, taking on more of a passive enjoyer role, I'm not really qualified anymore to touch on as something that may or may not be healthy for the community. But one thing is for certain, it did create an accessible avenue for people to give Street Fighter 6 a chance, which is maybe something that might not On the 2nd of June, EA-owned Fire Monkeys based out of Melbourne, Australia was hit with a wave of layoffs. Up to two-thirds of the company were told they will either be laid off or moved elsewhere. The company previously handled three live service games for mobile, Real Racing 3, Need for Speed No Limits, and The Sims Freeplay. EA's reasoning for this was wanting Fire Monkeys to be a single title studio. A day before, Poland-based CD Projekt Red laid off 30 staff as their support for Gwent came to an end and the game was changed to a community-led project called Gwentfinity. Adam Kinski of CD Projekt Red was declared the richest CEO in Poland in 2020. I think it's safe to say no one saw the success Baldur's Gate 3 found coming. Everyone who played it in the years of early access knew it was something special, but a CRPG based on Dungeons & Dragons is still a difficult thing to sell to a mainstream audience. But with a stable game on release that featured no microtransactions whatsoever, word of mouth spread among dedicated gamers hungry for a well-designed, system-rich, big-budget RPG to sink their teeth into. And as clips of character and story moments started hitting socials, more people became interested in seeing what the fuss was all about. This game coming out felt like a once-in-a-lifetime event. Its release, its place in the cultural zeitgeist, the absolute absurd amount of game to play, it's not something easy to pull off, but Larian did it so seamlessly. It was something truly special to be a part of. I know this is a game I am going to be playing and talking about for years to come, even if no content is ever added from here on out. It will still be something I can go back to often. There's just that much of it. August saw Striking Distance Studios, the team behind late 2022's The Callisto Protocol, lay off 32 staff members just weeks after the release of the game's DLC. In a statement to IGN, Crafton and their subsidiary Striking Distance said they have implemented strategic changes that realign the studio's priorities to better position its current and future projects for success. Unfortunately, these changes have impacted 32 employees. Shanghao and Kim, CEO of Crafton Inc., who owns PUBG and PUBG Mobile, has a stake in the company worth at least $330 million. It's been a decade since a new 2D Mario game was released that wasn't the Maker series, and Nintendo came out swinging with Super Mario Wonder, a game that oozes style top to bottom, but it also has the substance to match. This is to me where Mario feels his best. Despite my love of some of the 3D endeavors, Mario just feels so good running left to right collecting power-ups and finding secrets along the way. The beauty of the simplicity of 2D Mario is how little needs to be added in order to make each new game feel fresh. This time, aside from the major elephant power-up, what is new here is just the pure style of it all. Aesthetically, it feels like an acid trip through a new land. Every wonder seed transforms the levels in so many fun and unique ways. Half the reward is just seeing what Nintendo will pull out for players in terms of the switch up that happens. In classic old school Mario fashion, the mainline progression of the game offers a lower bar of difficulty that slowly increases. But for the diehard platformer fans out there, secret hunting and going off the path will reward you with insanely tough levels to choose. At the end of October, industry giant Bungie, who are currently developing and maintaining Destiny 2, let go 100 staff, around 8% of their workforce, amid a 45% dip in projected revenue. CEO Pete Parsons made a statement later that day saying, These are truly talented people. If you have openings, I would highly recommend each and every one of them. 
the Destiny 2 community, industry people, and the games community at large lambasted him for an extremely tone-deaf statement. Decreased retention with the Lightfall expansion was said to be to blame, pushing Destiny 2's next expansion, The Final Shape, and their reboot of Long Dormant IP Marathon back. Among those extremely talented employees fired was Michael Salvatore, composer for the developer since 1997. In Santa Monica at Behemoth Studio Naughty Dog, at least 25 employees were laid off. This comes just after the news of CEO Evan Wells announcing his retirement. Naughty Dog had their hit game The Last of Us turned into a blockbuster television show that was met with massive success, but at the same time their multiplayer game was shelved. Those laid off were told to work out the month of their contract, pressured to keep quiet and not given severance. I wasn't able to talk about every amazing game that came out this year. There was simply too much good to be talked about. Spider-Man 2, Alan Wake 2, Pikmin 4, Final Fantasy 16, Armored Core 6, not to mention countless indies that redefined what their respective genres are, from Sea of Stars to Dredge. It's a fantastic time to love indies. Not only were there so many games I couldn't get around to playing, I couldn't even keep up with the games I wanted to be playing. And I know that is a sentiment felt by many, that's just how unprecedented this year has been. The conversation of best year for games of all time is a hard one to have, because taste is at the end of the day subjective. So one person's love of what came out might seem a bit lackluster to another, but it's hard to ignore 2023's impact on the industry and the expectations audience have for what's going to be released moving forward. As someone who isn't a game developer, watching the industry from the periphery is depressing. It's an industry that walks a rage's edge of mind-blowing creativity and crushing corporate pressure. As the fastest growing entertainment industry, it's easy to see how we got here, but it doesn't make it any less upsetting. We're in a time where Fortnite reached 44.7 million players in a single day, but just a month prior, Epic laid off 16% of their workforce, around 830 total people once again citing restructuring as the problem. In this case, the restructuring is the metaverse, the dream of a live service that is more than just a game, it's a media platform, as seen with their efforts to host in-game concerts. But this isn't the only issue for other studios I mentioned, but it is a common one. The constant need for games to always be online, always updating, always pushing technical boundaries, or some combination thereof, while also meeting the excessive expectations of short turnaround times, has led to an industry rife with crunch and high turnover rates for employees. The cost of a banner year of games was the people that made them. These are deeply ingrained issues within the industry, but a major one is games as a service and the endless games causing developers to get overscoped and as a result, leaving employees overworked. When CEOs overpromise and underdeliver, the ones to bear the brunt are those under them. The games industry has been decaying behind the scenes, but as more and more companies have massive layoffs that make waves through not only social media, but directly affect the workforce, these issues bubble to more common knowledge with those who spend a lot of time online, but the more mainstream crowd who just play video games are a lot harder to reach. I don't know what the solution is, but I think the more open and accepting of the terrible work conditions we are, hopefully that will temper the expectations of audiences. Wishful thinking, I know. In a year with major Hollywood strikes, a lot of people still don't get it. While layoffs can be mostly ignored by the general public, delays can't. And if people with platforms can make us think as to why, maybe the conversation can shift to be more for the workers instead of actively against them. 